are you or your people feeling frustrated, unempowered, and helpless, demoralized by your company's leaders and cultures? Do you feel like there's little, if anything, you can do to change things for the better? This is what we refer to as a loss of the sense of agency. When you feel like you don't have the real ability to improve your situation in meaningful ways, or you feel more like a victim of factors beyond your control. In this episode, I join with SVPG partner, Mari Kagan, and we discuss the very important but very difficult topic of agency. We will highlight some of the root causes and provide some coaching strategies to help you address this. Today, I'm super excited to have the godfather of products himself, Mari Kagan. Many of you know Mari, but I'm going to let him have a chance to tell you things you may not know about him. Mari, welcome to Product Therapy. Thanks very much, Christian. And, you know, for those listening, this is this was Christian's idea. But as soon as we heard it, we all said, oh, this is perfect. It's very much something that we think is missing. And we really wanted to uh, to try to help make it happen. If you do, If you know me, you know I've been doing product a very long time, literally more than 40 years. Uh, half my career was doing product. I started with 10 years as a developer, and then I moved into product and product leadership and general management, and then half my career really uh, helping others uh, do product. And one of the things I realized early on, really the big motivation for SVPG and really for this podcast too, I think, is um, we see such a big difference between how the best companies do product and how most people do product. It's really, I think, wasted potential. In fact, the, the subtitle of the book, Empowered, was Ordinary People, Extraordinary Products. We see that everywhere. It doesn't take, you know, magical people in order to create magical products. It just takes good people with some good leaders that can help them reach their potential. And this is kind of what inspired Silicon Valley Product Group. It inspires our books. It inspires the talks and the coaching we do. And I, and I think it inspires this conversation right now. And, and Matt, when we think about what we're trying to do with this podcast and who we're trying to reach, uh, who do you think we should be making our message for? Who is this podcast really for? I do think the things we're going to talk about are going to be relevant really to anybody in the product world. But explicitly, I feel like we are talking directly to the people who are responsible for developing the people on the teams. That's product leaders and that's product coaches. As long as they genuinely care about helping their people, we can help them. Yeah, and, and, and I'm hoping that that's something that we start to break a cycle within the industry, that if we can grill good product leaders, we will get good product teams in a meaningful way. I, you know, I'm very sensitive to the number of podcasts out there and talks about the craft of product. And here we're trying to talk about what's really behind the craft of product. Um, how do you think we can differentiate the time we spend together from other podcasts out there? Yeah, and I uh, I know this is true for both of us, Christian, but we do a lot of, we're guests on a lot of podcasts. I enjoy doing those. Most of those podcasts are focused on the craft of product, which, of course, both of us love the craft of product. I talk about, in fact, just yesterday did one on product strategy. I love talking about those things. Uh and I do think they're super important. But the truth is, um, it's a lot easier to show people how to do a great product vision. It's harder, but still doable to teach them how to do a good insight-driven product strategy. Love coaching people on how to do, you know, tackle hard risks in product discovery and come up with a great solution. That, though, is a lot easier overall than getting people to change sort of their hearts and minds, getting them to change their behaviors, getting them to change their mindsets. And these are things we rarely talk about in, in podcasts. Honestly, we don't even write much about them because this gets pretty, I mean, uh, the truth is it gets very personal very quickly. This is an area that's normally pretty sensitive to talk about. I know that you do this too, but I spend a lot of my time having those conversations, but they're one-on-one -on -one conversations. We can literally, whether it's over Zoom or over coffee, we can have a hard conversation about maybe their behaviors and why they're not really serving their best interests. Yeah, we, it's, uh, it's a harder thing to try to do that in this forum, but, but I think that's what we want to try to do. You know, we, we, we always say product is hard and maybe even product leadership is harder. 
And I think at the heart of behind the, the difficulty behind it is not a lack of frameworks or books or techniques or uh, methodologies that people have put out there is that products are built by people. <laughs> and there are some real underlying hard issues about dealing with people in product work uh, that I really think is underserved. And I, you know, I know the heart of why you coach people, why you spend time coaching people. And, and I think that's the heart behind this podcast is that we believe that if we have an authentic forum to talk about these issues, we can hopefully get good outcomes uh, in the companies we serve. Okay, let's talk a little about what we'll focus on in this podcast. But I, before we jump in, Maria, I, I, there's a big caveat here because we're calling this product therapy. We are not therapists, but sometimes the best we can do is to encourage someone to talk to a professional. Yeah, I think it's very important because I don't think we can talk about these issues without bumping up against people's personalities, their values, their, their, the way they think about themselves, the way they think about others. So one alternative is you just don't talk about these topics. They're too dangerous to talk about. But the other idea, and I think this is what uh, we're going to try to do here, and we want to try to do is just to be very sensitive to these topics, but get them out on the table. One of the things that I think we've all learned, most people who've been product leaders for a while have learned, I, I learned this very painfully, when you do talk about people's behaviors and mindset, some of that's pretty straightforward, like getting them to like really understand the value of a sense of ownership, for example. You, you can get that across. But, but very often you bump up against deeper issues. And there can be lots of reasons for the way they think or the way they behave. Obviously, lots of people suffer from depression, from anxiety, from phobias. These things are real. What really changed my mind, really just indelibly changed how I think about coaching, was um, I haven't ever shared this story before. You'll understand why. But my last real job was product leader at eBay. And um, I had an, a wonderful administrative assistant. And all was great, but I did start to notice some uh, forgetfulness. But if you know me, I forget things constantly. So to me, that's just like, oh, you're more like me, you know, forgetting things. Uh, and I honestly didn't think much of it until uh, a Monday morning when her husband called me and said during the weekend, she didn't wake up. And they rushed her to the hospital and there was a major brain tumor. And he was asking me, did I, you know, the doctors are asking, had we seen, you know, diff changes in her behavior? I immediately, of course, flat, felt huge flood of guilt. So did he, by the way. We were both felt guilty because, well, I was sort of living with her during the day and he was obviously her spouse. And, um, but I'm like, I noticed forgetfulness, but I thought that was just normal, uh, like, like most of us. And um, anyway, well, actually, the CEO of eBay, her husband was the head of neurosurgery at Stanford and went to him. Well, I went to her and she went to him and she got wonderful care. But by the time, you know, this was too late. And anyway, it, re it made me realize that behaviors can be changed, caused by all kinds of things. You know, somebody struggling with the loss of a relative or just struggles in their marriage or anything. And so I, I genuinely try not to assume anything about their motivations. And just what I really want to do is show them I care. I want to yes. show them I care. I want to pay attention to these things because genuinely I want them to love their job. And I want them to feel like they're doing something meaningful. Maddie, thank you so much for um, sharing that story and, and the heart behind that story. I am. Um, it resonates a whole lot with me. I, I lost a very close friend and probably one of the best minds in engineering that I had ever worked with. And uh, this was someone that brought a sense of joy to all that he met, did amazing work in pulling people together. Um, and, and I lost him during COVID and in kind of an absent way, I uh, also dealt with, with issues of, of depression too as well that took away um, in their private life from the things that he did professionally. And, and I really think, you know, we kind of go back to the hearts behind the work we do and uh, the reality that people build products 
and and it's not a, a magical factory where things are manufactured and you're pushing buttons and things go together. And um, and you're bringing different people of different backgrounds, different stages in your life. And I and I've not felt any uh, better calling as a leader to exact the kind of care and nurturing and the environment to allow the best of those people to come out and thrive. And um, you know, I want to recognize that as we go through this, that um, these are hard topics. But if you genuinely care and you try to notice changes in your people and you look out for those behavioral changes. Um, there are many explanations, and we are accountable to, uh, as leaders, to to tackle those. I, I want to really shift gears to really the topic today, and we're going to call it coaching agency. Agency is an interesting word. Uh, many people I may not be familiar with the term agency, so I, I want to make sure when we talk about a sense of agency, what we really mean here. Um, uh, Mari, what are your thoughts on what does agency really mean to you? Well. In the work context, it really means do people feel like they have an ability to change their circumstances in meaningful ways versus, say, feeling the victim of factors beyond their control? Anybody who's been in our industry for a long time um, or for any amount of time really has heard people frustrated. Um, I, I, I get so many people reach out to me. Mostly, they tell me they're, they're trapped in a feature team. I often hear that word, trapped in a feature team. And they feel like, you know, our managers don't get it, our executives don't get it, not, you know, everything's set up to like not let me do my job the way it needs to be done. That's definitely a feeling of a lack of agency. We can talk about whether it's always justified or not, but they feel like they have no ability to fix things. And a lot of times they just ask me, do I need to leave switch companies? Uh, you know, that's that's sort of the conclusion they've come to, that maybe I have to leave company. And I companies and I try to encourage them, there's actually a lot you can do inside your company. Let's talk about that first. But anyway, that's what it really means is do they feel like they have ability to influence their life, at, you know, at work at least. Yeah. And, and I would love to get some more examples of this because when people say, I feel trapped, I'm working in a feature team, um, they're describing a specific environment, right? An environment in which they are given features to go build or given roadmaps or tasks to go execute. Um, and they don't feel in some sense empowered to solve problems. But really what you're saying here, uh, they feel no responsibility for delivering outcomes, right? Um, give me some examples of how this manifests in a, in, in a product environment. Can, it's the specific language and behaviors that are indications of a sense of agency that you've seen. Well, you do often hear these symptoms for sure. They, they'll say they feel like yeah, they're just given a roadmap and all they're told there. In fact, the language of missionaries versus mercenaries resonate, resonates a lot with people who feel like low self uh, sense of agency. They feel like they're they're literally been hired as mercenaries. And if they, they, I've had people tell me if I don't just do what I'm told, they'll find somebody else to work here. So there is um, uh, that behavior. Another one that you just alluded to that's a very big one is uh, sometimes, you know, look, a lot of people, um, they think that's the job is to work on a feature team. They kind of think that's it. That's not unusual. And then what happens is somebody in the organization learns, you know, feature teams are not all that impressive as far as delivering results. And maybe what we need to do is this focus on outcomes. And of course, that's what drives empowered product teams. That's what drives product discovery, all that. But the focus is on outcomes. But now all of a sudden, your job is not just to build what somebody else has decided for you to build. You've been asked to come up with that solution. You've been asked to anticipate the problems and address them proactively. And this can cause, well, first of all, it can understandably cause a lot of anxiety. That is a much harder job. It's the first thing anybody who knows anything about product will tell you. Outcomes is a whole lot harder than output. A whole lot harder. Of course, that's why a lot of us got into the business in the first place is because that's what we wanted to do, but not everybody. Many people have spent five years or more in a feature team, and this idea of being empowered, 
this idea of being asked to be take responsibility for an outcome, that can feel overwhelming. You know, Mari, we, we talk about the true test of empowered teams. And I want to make sure, because you're calling about that anxiety of I'm thinking on outcomes and I'm thinking in my head, okay, uh, first, you want to make sure you have the skills to do the job. Is the anxiety driven by, I don't really feel I know how, what to do if I'm given outcomes. Uh, and the second is, you know, you talk about range of skills. Will I be supported? You know, is this a, you know, we talk about product being a team sport. Am I really alone and accountable for these outcomes? Is my leader going to participate? Is, am I going to get help in this? You know, so even the nature of before giving you problems to solve, where do you think the sense of competence fits in? And the feeling of that anxiety, is it is the pressure more from the idea of, I don't know how to do it? Uh, this was that sense of, uh, you know, how do I do it if I uh, with others? Well, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of possible explanations for that. In fact, that's exactly the kind of discussion I like to have with people on a one-on-one basis when we're talking about this, because it is not unusual. And by the way, I think it's totally normal. Just to be very clear, very normal that if you've been in a feature team for years and now you're being given all this bigger responsibility. It is normal to have a lot of questions about what this really means and about for yourself. Um, the first most basic question that sometimes, you know, this is a conversation is, well, what does the person even want out of the job? Are they, are they in it for a career? Are they doing it because it's their passion? It's their calling? Or, you know, there are people out there that just want to be told what to do. And that's, um, and I'm not judging here. I mean, I probably am a little bit, you can kind of hear it, but uh, I totally respect that there are people in the world that do not want the pressure of this additional responsibility of being, of the necessity for real agency. You you wrote an article recently about like product management theater and, and another one on product leadership theater. Is there a place for people that are saying, I want to work in a future team. I just want to be given a list of tasks to do without the need for feeling any sense of ownership around outcomes. And is there an argument that, you know, that is not the product manager in some ways, but what is that? And, and maybe give me some sense of why you wrote those articles, because it seems to uh, really align with this discussion we're having here. Now, I think it does for absolutely. Um, you know, what What was really on behind those articles was so many people I meet, like I said, are, are unhappy and they're frustrated. And this really bothers me. Partly, I don't like to see people, especially people I really know and like, unhappy. Who does, right? But also, I look, there's millions of people I have never met and probably will never meet, but I still hate the idea of all this wasted potential in the world. There is so much untapped potential in the world. So to me, I mean, is there, you know, use for feature teams? Maybe, but I can't see, I I can't see a scenario where it's not, because an empowered product team could do everything a feature can can do, plus a lot more. So the question is, is it useful just to have those partial skills? I don't know. I, I, I will say this. That's not my focus. There are plenty of other, in fact, most organizations out there, most books in the product space, most blogs, most training courses are all about feature teams. So I'm like, go to one of them. That's not what we're here to help you for. We're here if you actually want to do something meaningful and amazing with your team. That's why I love this space. I mean, I was lucky and I I know you were too, we got to experience what it's like early in our career. And once you've sort of experienced that, you know, you don't want to be on a feature team. I have no desire to ever do that. So that's important. That's a big difference. I mean, I, the reason I bring this up is because if they don't actually care, it's kind of table stakes is to care. <laughs> they have to yeah. care. Um, and I can't, that's something that I don't know how to make somebody really care most people that I do work with, thankfully, the vast majority of them, they absolutely care. And in fact, the fact that they care is why they're frustrated, because they want to do more. They know they can do more, but they feel like they're not being allowed to do more. 
Sometimes though, since you brought like what, why are the reasons for this? Sometimes they do want to do more, but then I, another layer to this question of agency. Some people don't believe, I don't even know the, really the right word for this. The way I describe it is they don't feel they're worthy. They don't feel like they're like, I, I've literally been told this. I'm just a new product manager. Why should I get to decide these things? And my answer, of course, is, well, that's what your job is. You've been hired for that. They're like, you know, I, I'm not that. I, I mean, uh, that could have millions of dollars of implications. How should I be allowed to do that? This really gets to this sense of self-worth. And do they believe that they can and should, this is more the should, have that impact? Uh, and, and my argument to them, and I try to convince them, not only can you, but that's your job. You know, your company is counting on you to do that. And maybe the third one I see that's worth getting out on the table here, Christian, while we're getting all these deep issues out here, <laughs> is um, the truth is, if you're being told what to do in a feature team, that's a much lower stress environment. If things go wrong, it's not your fault. So you'll probably point at the stakeholder that said to do this or somebody. On the other hand, if you've been empowered and you now have been told you're responsible for that outcome, okay, the good news is I can finally do what I want to do. The bad news is if it doesn't work, who am I going to blame? There's a lot of fear that can come along. There are people that are genuinely scared. Now, sometimes that's legit because they have seen what happens when people take risks in their company and they're often right. punished for it. Of course, yes. that's the last thing you want to do if you're trying to develop a good culture. And so, anyway, but, but we know that. But other times, they're scared just because this is new territory. This would, they don't know what would happen if they think this is the right thing to do. They do their homework, but it turns out not to be the right thing. Does that mean they're going to get fired? Does that mean their career is you know, ruined? That's, they, they don't know because they've never had a chance to sort of do that in a safe space. And, and I mean, you're, you're really hitting on the hearts of why this is such a difficult topic. You know, they, they, there is this sense of, do people really care? Do they really feel worthy? Are the drivers of fear? I mean, we, we talk about um, a lot of this being some learned behavior, the idea that people will do things to avoid a consequence or maybe experience a reward. You know, um, and some cultures reinforce helplessness, uh, you know, and, and you can imagine that cycle that feeds um, a sense of control in being a victim. You kind of feel more in control. Ah, you know, there's nothing I could do about it. You know, it's always bigger than me. Um, and I think you touched on something the way I always describe it is like if, if you are never at the wheel, uh, things are never your fault. You know, it's, uh, you, you can get comfortable in that protection of saying, Look, you know, this is always outside of something I can ever control or do. And you can imagine that feeling itself in a, in a culture and, and the blame game. I think uh, uh, Shri has actually called something out in, when you talked about uh, product uh, leadership theater. And I think I had that quote, uh, which is many leaders go through their entire career blaming down kind of their teams and blaming up their executives and maybe blaming sideways you know, their cross-functional peers and their counterparts, and they don't seem to realize how much agency they truly have. Same, you know, give me your thoughts on that. I, I thought that really just captured a lot, in, easier at individual contributors, but this is also a leadership pattern too as well. It is. And by the way, I'm glad you mentioned Shriash because those who don't know, uh, at SVPG, we are all big Shriash fans. He's one of our favorite thinkers in product, and he totally gets this stuff He's been living it. I met him 20 years ago when he was an engineer and wanted to move into product and just what a great career he's had and great experiences. But he's so right. We we both see this this lack of agency. And it's it's striking because if you've worked in environments where you really do get to work with real agency and you get to solve problems to you, then you feel very much like, of course, you would work this way. But if you've never worked in that environment, it's understandable why so many people are scared of the unknown. 
And and they're not even confident of their own abilities, right? I, I mean, how would they have had a chance to really test those? Woo, who we we, we got to talk about coaching this. You know, I was uh, talking to a, a company and we were talking about the engineers uh, not feeling any sense of accountability for the code they put out. You know, there's a team that releases products and there's a team that fixes bugs and they have lots of bugs. And I say, well, you know, I said the same thing to my kids. If you have to clean the bathroom, you stop peeing on the floor. And I said, you know, there's no connection to outcomes. It kind of feeds itself. If all I'm accountable for is shipping code, if all I'm accountable for is releasing things, and I don't care about the impact on customers, the business, or revenue, or a brand, then, you know, that's someone else's problem. It, it kind of feeds that victimhood in some ways. But I want to really shift now because... I don't want to leave this feeling some sense of helplessness myself we, because it feels like a really deep rooted issue, not just in the culture of teams, but in individuals. So maybe we can talk a little how we might coach and develop an agency mindset. As sometimes it's an easy issue people don't understand that they would have. I, maybe talk about how much self-awareness people have about this issue. And let's talk about maybe some practical ways through examples for how we can tackle it. Well, one of the things I like to do is uh, I, I do think those discussions I alluded to earlier where I'm trying to understand the person. This is a one-on-one -on -one conversation too, right? This is not a group thing. This is one-on-one. -on -one. What are their concerns? Now, it's not that hard to explain them the theoretical concept of an empowered team. <laughs> Most people like, can recite the words. They know what to say. They know, oh, outcome's good, output bad. They know that stuff. But they haven't actually tried to do it, so they don't necessarily know all the emotions uh, that, that that's going to bring up. So I do like to get that out on the table. And you know, don't forget, we're probably talking... Uh, years, if not a lifetime of sort of habits <laughs> that are very ingrained. So for example, in my one-on-ones, it's so common that the first thing people will bring are all the things they're not being allowed to do or all the things they're, they're, that have gone wrong. And it's not their fault. Right. Like, you know, here's a real example I just did with one of the companies I advise. Uh, one of the product managers made the, I call it a mistake, I told her it was a mistake, to have a group meeting, to group meeting with a bunch of stakeholders in the same room. And of course, uh, that rarely goes well. Right. <laughs> that rarely goes well. You're kind of asking for it. And uh, of course, her immediate frustration was, oh no, they, all these people have these objections. They said, we can't do this without making big changes, but they won't say what the changes are. And, and I'm like, okay. Well, first of all, we can recover from this, but let's talk about what could you have done differently? Uh, for example, one of the things we learn is the value of doing one-on-one -on -one discussions with each member and not doing it in a group forum. And what happens then? If somebody has a concern, they can raise it to you and give you the chance to address it and not in a group forum. Also in a group forum, it quickly degenerates into design by committee. They're all trying to solve for you because their view is obviously you can't do it or you wouldn't be bringing this to us. And so um, what we talk about is let's talk about all the ways you could going forward. You can learn from that and realize there are so many things that you could do. Uh, another example in this case was they were they had all these PowerPoint slides trying to describe what they wanted. And I'm like, with these stakeholders, do you really think that works? How about a prototype? If you want to mm. win hearts and minds, show a prototype. They will get that. And it is amazing how people will move mountains to make that become a reality. How yes. often does anybody get inspired by a PowerPoint slide? Oh, boy. I mean, you're talking about even invoking care by seeing something tangible, right? In some ways. And, you know, I know we always tell people avoid group meetings and many people fail to understand what's at the heart and soul of that. It, it, it's kind of like the fastest way to derail any good product work. You know, I, I always say like there's the people effect, you know, like if the CEO says, that's a terrible idea, who is the next person to speak right. up? And what do they say if they speak up? Yes, I agree. <laughs> it is a terrible idea. Everybody just agrees with the person in the room. And you, you end up seeing this um, smartest person in the room or maybe someone is in the room with your boss and they want to demonstrate to their boss that they are paying attention. So they feel like they ask a smart question. 
They need to demonstrate they know what they're talking about. And your whole meeting is derailed by somebody trying to prove their competency in a test. Or you, you get what I always call um, the little Star Wars syndrome in twin departments. A, a finance person will ask a legal question. And a legal will be like, how dare you ask a question about my department? So I'm not going to ask a finance question. And it just goes back and forth. Uh, you know, and so you're absolutely spot on in this idea of uh, doing a one-on-one. It's hard for people to kind of understand that. But in the same way we want a manager to coach a team in a one-on-one, we want product people, you know, in terms of going to stakeholders in one-on-ones. You know, if you show a prototype, you're creating this compelling argument of what you're trying to create in the world. You're, you're getting them to care rather than, you know, I sent you an email. I would love to build it. What do you think? Or, yeah, my thoughts on this or some presentation. Um, and you're, you're asking them to participate in doing that, you know, um, you know, one of the things you, you kind of hinted on as I'm thinking through this tactically, how do we coach people and develop people with the mindset? It, in some ways, you're trying to get people to care. And, and I always say, you know, okay, well, uh, the person coaching also has to care to be able to demonstrate to people what care looks like. Uh, um, and, and that sense of ownership around it. You know, one of the things um, uh, I often see from many people I coach is this idea of, engineers not caring about it. Um, and I, I tell people, well, an engineer pulls a story from a Jira board and it's ticket number 5023. Like, you know, that's a very tax-oriented output. And my favorite technique for getting an engineer to care is connecting an engineer with a customer. That's right. And it's, it's, it feels crazy in some ways, but some of the best products I've worked in the world the engineer does not say, I am building this for so they call out names. I'm building for Susan. I am building for, you know, Jennifer. They have customers in their head that they can imagine their solution solving a problem for. You know, I always say, you know, I can't remember the last time I actually wrote a story for like a bug in some ways. So I fix and I come. So I said, what do you do when you want to fix a bug? I said, well, you know, I, I tell her, the engineer that I know is on the team. I said, let me take you for lunch. And by the way, if you don't know this, uh, engineers love free lunch. You know, I've not met an engineer that can resist a free lunch. And I said, let me take you for lunch, you know. It's like, yeah, we'll just start and we'll do a thing. But before that, um, I have this quick customer meeting or this customer call. I would just love for you to hang out with me while I do it. It should just be a few minutes and then we'll go for lunch, you know. Now, I already know this customer has this bug or this issue or, or something that's affecting them. And some way through the conversation, I guide the customer towards that bug. And you're like, did you see this? This is terrible. It upsets me. I don't understand why it's moving this way. And I'm like, really? Do say more. Tell me more. We go through that. I say, oh, thank you for your time. You know, and I just take the engineer to lunch. We talk about life. We bond. Somehow, magically, by the end of that week, Marty, the bug disappears. It disappears, you know? And, and I tell people, this is why I have not met an engineer that can stand people calling their baby ugly. That's right. But what you're really doing here is it is impossible for someone to see a real customer, someone in the world that has a pain and you know it is within your realm of control to actually tackle that, improve their lives by something you can do that allows you to just say, you know what, I will wait for the ticket to be written. I will wait for, you know, and, and I think in some ways when I'm thinking about coaching this mindset, we have to get good of not just connecting people to the outcome, but to the people that will benefit from that outcome. That's a beautiful example because so many people do. They tell me, you know, their frustration is the engineers are not interested. And I, you know, I always give my little talk about how, you know, in a good product team, the engineers do not have to do what the product manager says. And that's, that's designed to be that way because it might be that the product manager is wrong. This makes no sense. More likely, it does make sense, but the product manager has not spent the time with the team so they understand why. And you don't want engineers behaving like mercenaries. So I will often say, if your engineers are feeling that way, it's probably a sign that you are not including them where you need to include them. The magic happens when you connect those. In fact, a lot of product managers make the mistake of thinking their job is to shelter the engineers. And, you know, this is the other thing that motivated those two articles. 
in a feature team, they have people called product managers or product owners, sometimes both. But then neither of those are what we need. And the job definition is so far off. And somebody had forwarded me this article from one of the biggest schools of teaching product people. And it was defining how they define product management. And I'm like, I can't believe they said this out loud because this is exactly what's wrong with the feature team industry. That was literally defining project manager. None of what we're talking about today is included in that job. And, you know, it's not hard to see why people are so confused and so nervous about these differences. They're just getting completely mixed messages. Now, Manny, on that point, you're kind of establishing a fundamental truth that at the real heart of good product work are people that care, are leaders that care, uh, you know, and, and we understand, you know, companies are caring about a better outcome for it. For customers, they recognize they get something back from that. But good product work at the heart is, uh, is care from leaders and the people working on the team. Is that something you hire for? Is that something you assess in some ways? Like, you know, do you look for it up front? Do you coach it continuously as you go through? You know, is there a breaking point of where that disappears in people? Uh, it feels like the DNA of good product work is that people care. Now, this is another big one that speaks to all these same points and more, by the way. We're talking about agency, but there's a lot of other related attributes that we'll hopefully talk about in future ones. But I do know this. In good product model companies, I know they do explicitly hire for this. And I'm not talking just product managers. They're talking about designers, engineers. They want people to care. They want them to be passionate about the things they create. They want them to believe that they're doing a, you know, you're not necessarily curing cancer, but you are helping the world. You can help users in their daily lives, in their personal lives. They feel like they're doing something meaningful and they want people that feel that way. And it's our job as leaders to help people understand how the work they will do will be meaningful. Let's say I'm a leader, have never had a chance to experience working in an outcome-based environment, in an empowered environment. I even have no sense for what strong product work looks like. How do I get help on this kind of thing? This is the catch-22 in the industry, right? That so many people at this point do know that, boy, the way a lot of these companies work is very different from how they work. And they know they can see the business results, the stock price, they can see these things. But it doesn't make it easier. How do you change? You know, they've never done it. Well, one is that is one of the big reasons we wrote the new book, Transformed, was to help companies understand the things they could do to make progress from where they are today to what we're talking about. But more generally, sometimes there are leaders that have been brought into the company or are already working there that do know this way of working. And so going and spending time with them and asking them to show that can help. But this most scalable solution I know in this situation, when you don't have leaders that have been there, done that, and that's what product leadership coaches is for. That's what product coaching in general is for. Now, the prerequisite here is that any product coach that you get needs to actually know what they're talking about. And I can't emphasize that enough. That is one of the real problems in our industry is people like agile coaches that have actually never done built products before. So they are not able to help. Too many of them are not able to help. Some have, thankfully, but most have not. And same with product, you have to be careful. You have to make sure they have actually been there, done that at a product company. But if they have, they can do an amazing amount to help the leader learn alongside her organization. And this has got to be different from coaching principles or techniques. Yeah, it's what we're talking about. That's why it's so important to get somebody that's really, because again, you can read books and watch YouTube videos on how to do a product vision, and you can probably fake your way through it. But if you have not done, you know, worked with people to develop them into what we're talking about, people with a real sense of agency, with a real sense of ownership, that's going to be a uh, you're just not, they're not, not going to know what to do to help. Yeah. They won't be able to even relate. So, so, so I am a product leader and I want to learn how to work in this kind of environment. I need to get some coaching if I haven't like, seen good work. Uh, what if I'm an 
individual contributor? Uh, is there ways I up level, uh, tackle this? What can I yeah, do? Yeah, because there are so many people in the, exactly what you described. They are trapped in a feature team, but they want to see what can they do to show their company, their manager, the rest of their team that they're capable of doing more. Uh, you know, the first thing they worry about is, well, we know that the CEO is incredibly important. I don't even know who our CEO is and probably wouldn't talk to me and all this. So what can you do as an individual contributor? Turns out you can do a lot. And so what I encourage people to do, there are limits, of course, but you can do a lot to earn that next right. Starts by up-leveling your skills as a product. If you're a product owner, or a feature team product manager, which is essentially a project manager, you can start by developing the skills yourself to make yourself a real product manager. I promise you that will be appreciated somewhere in your company, definitely in future companies. That will be a free, the things you learn. Well, doing a lot of what we were talking about, going out and talking to customers, really getting to know users and customers, really diving deep into the data, really learning about the different parts of the business. Just that third one, learning about the business, if you take the initiative to go learn what the financial constraints are, what the marketing constraints are, how does go-to-market work in your company with your products? Uh, how are your products monetized? What are the compliance issues? This is what it means to be a product manager, an individual contributor product manager. But if you do that, I promise you, your stakeholders will notice your manager will notice, you're probably your manager's manager will notice. And you don't even, people will see that you know what you're talking about. It is a completely different game. Contrast that with a typical product owner that knows none of this. They know how to manage a backlog in Jira. That's not the job. That's right. I, I, you know, you're describing this and I'm saying it's absolutely impossible not to care when you grow your knowledge of the customer, your knowledge of the business issues, your knowledge of how things work, the knowledge of the constraints in your environment, when you're looking at the data, when you see, so, so, you know, in some ways, um, there is some sense that as an individual contributor, if you focus heavily on trying to get a deep knowledge of your business, these are the things you need to do product yes. work, <laughs> that in some ways it creates a sense of agency. I think it does. You know? Now, um, I always want to leave every episode uh, with a coaching techniques to, to practice in the coming week. I, I you know, I go, we've, we've kind of talked about this uh, coaching agency, the sense of agency in a company. We've talked about the impact on individuals and the impact on leaders and what that does in an environment. So this week's practice tip, um, I want to talk about this specific example of I am trapped in a future team. My leaders give me uh, features to build. They give me roadmaps. I am working on outputs. No one gives me problems to solve. So here's my tip of the week uh, to help you do that. Remember, we've kind of defined that the job of real product managers are to solve problems, to focus on outcomes. So if someone comes to you and gives you a roadmap, a task, an output, it doesn't matter who is in the company. Here's my favorite technique for turning that in to a problem to solve. First thing I say, that's a great idea. No matter what someone says to me in a company, the reason I always start by saying that is because there should be no other place in a company that is safe for people to come to with ideas. I don't know where else you're going to go in the company. We need to be a safe place for people to do that. Secondly, I want to be this amen about it. You know, I, I don't want people to feel like this. Uh, there has to be friction, some formal request. But more importantly, you see, I'm framing it as an idea because I need to clarify it's not a directive from a leader. It's not something they require me to do unless they explicitly say to me, it's a directive. I'm like, that's a great idea. The next thing I say is, I want to make sure we succeed when we do this. Now, the reason I say when, people always say, if we do this, that's already a fighting stance. When is also not a promise or a contract. You're kind of saying to someone, look, when we do what you want us to do, I want to make sure we're successful at it. So yes, now what I say, what problem are we trying to solve? and how we know we've succeeded. So this is the practice I want teams to have. Leaders should have that with their other leaders and teams. One of the things I see in this pattern is that most leaders tell people what to do because they don't have context themselves. 
And so some leader didn't give them clarity about why we're doing it. And so they can't give you clarity about why you should. And the cycle feeds itself. So the practice of the week, if you have a roadmap item, if you're given an output or a task to complete, whatever comes to you, encourage people to keep bringing it to you by saying that's a great idea. Be clear with them about those two questions. What problems are we trying to solve and how we measure success? What you've done there is you've turned that into a problem to solve. And you can start to focus on outcomes. Now, that's the easy part. The hard part now really goes back to leaders. You've now given people outcomes. You've now given them problems to solve. How do you develop a sense of agency after you've done that? You hear things from people like, well, that's great, but it wouldn't work here. Or our leaders just don't understand. Or it's not my job. Or, or they blame somebody else for that. We've kind of talked through this conversation today about the root causes of learned behavior and what people's motivations are. Remember, it's very hard for people to care if you don't care as a leader. A demonstration of your care is a reflection of what we've talked about, a deep understanding of the context, being able to provide clarity as to why we're doing things, understanding an individual's need and their individual situation. We've kind of talked about that. This is a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You don't coach agency in a group setting. You don't do it in a team meeting. You don't go to say, well, everybody should own this in some ways. Remember, even teams have groups of individuals coming together. And so I am calling out here the opposite of self-helplessness is self-efficacy. You need to work with people about why their role matters and how they contribute to doing that. It has been nothing but an absolute pleasure to spend time with you, Mari, having this conversation today. Thank you, Mari, for being here and for sharing your insights. Uh, thank you, Christian, for spearheading this idea and inviting me to join you. And I hope this is useful to people. Wow, time flew by. That's the end of our first episode of Product Therapy. Want to learn more until next time? Please check out svpg.com. Sign up for our newsletter that Matty Kagan puts out. Join us for one of our workshops near you and get access to all of the articles and content we put out. In addition to our current books, we are very excited about our new book, Transform, which helps companies move to the product model. Manny, why don't you take some time to tell us about Transformed and why we wrote it? You know, we wrote inspired for product teams. We wrote empowered for product leaders. And the good news is that a lot of people seem to buy that and read it and like it. We love that. However, the most common question we've been getting for years is that the way we describe in that book, the way of working we describe, and how they work today is so different that people, their first reaction is, is it even possible to make the degree of change needed in order to move to this product model? And we wanted to answer that question with this book. It's broader than our other books where we're focused on product people. This is focused at everybody in the company from the CEO on down to every stakeholder wants to know how they can engage with the product teams constructively. The book talks about uh, a dozen examples of companies that have successfully transformed to the model and what they've been able to do since they've been able to transform. And it talks about really what are the principles that are important in working this way. Thank you, Mari, for joining us here today. And as always, for sharing your insights. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Until next time, have a good day.